Uh, first, let me apologize for uh, my tardiness. I was trying to finish off this um, uh, the notes for you. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to uh, get them printed. It's basically finished, but I couldn't get it printed in time. So I will bring it with me, inshallah, tomorrow. Definitely. <laughs> now, also, because um, there is uh, uh, some aspect of the course that I wanted to do which involved the actual analysis of a hadith and how it takes place and you need to have, I can it's too much material to write on the board, you really need, do need to have, you know, this text in your hand so you can look at the chart and see how it, uh, it is. So I'm going to save that, I was going to do it today but since I couldn't get the book together in time, I'll leave that until tomorrow. <clears throat> uh, the topic we did yesterday you know, dealt with the uh, hadith da'if and its categories and uh, at the end of it after analyzing the ways by which a hadith is uh, classified da'if and we said that it is based on defects either defects in the chain of the narrators, the isnad, or defects in the narrator himself. And the defects in the chain, we went and looked at, it meant basically breaks in the chain, either the beginning or the end or in the middle, uh, more than one or a few, uh, you know. Uh, then we looked at obvious breaks and hidden breaks. Then we looked at the uh, defects in the narrators, which had to do with either his adala, right, his uh, integrity, or his bot, or accuracy. And we looked at the two categories and the subcategories under it. And um, out of it, we also looked at the fabricated hadiths, which came out of uh, the adala issue of um, defect, where there was defect in integrity, where narrators were known to be liars, they're referred to as known liars, and in such cases, their hadiths, whatever they narrated, would be classified as fabrications. And we talked about the fact that hadiths could be elevated, a hadith which may be da'if in and of itself, may be elevated to the level of Hassan li ghayrihi because we talked about Hassan li dhatihi and Hassan li ghayrihi and um, a hadith which is Hassan could be elevated to Sahih li ghayrihi because of other supportive narrative, narrations right? uh, so <clears throat> we pointed out that the hadith which has a liar in the chain is one which cannot be elevated under any circumstances. And then we also discuss the issue of the use of weak hadiths. In what circumstances is it acceptable to use such hadiths? We talked about the different opinions of the scholars with regard to it. We said basically the hadith scholars didn't want to use it at all. For the most part, they didn't want it. But the fiqh scholars, uh, some of them uh, developed a line of rationale for it where it, it was in virtuous deeds where it was not introducing any new practice. And we gave the example of Salatul Hajjah, right? Which is a new practice, you know? Or you have as a, one of the forms of Salawat, they have one called uh, 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 Salat al Nariya, Salatul Nariya, which is very popular in India and Sri Lanka and these places. You know, it's a, it is a form of Salawat, but it is totally fabricated. You know, and they attribute it back to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but it's, you know, it's, it's fabricated and it contains in it shirk. I mean, clear statements of shirk. Anyway, uh, we then looked at the uh, causes of fabrication. We identified four of the main causes. There, was, there were a couple of other causes which I didn't mention. I'll just mention them now. One was that of storytellers, that you had people you know, just as we have today, we have novels because books are readily available. We are entertained by listen to, listening to or to reading stories. 
right? We have the movies or whatever now, radio. Uh, stories are told. People enjoy stories. And these stories are, for the most part, fictional stories. And in the past, you had people who were storytellers. You know, I think they, they still have people around doing this. And in fact, I remember reading about some literary contest in England where they brought storytellers from different parts of the world telling stories. <laughs> so it still goes on. Anyway, the point is that in the, um, in the period when hadiths were being narrated, storytellers also, uh, for the purpose of you know, promoting their, their trade, uh, and of course the storyteller, you know, at the end of his telling his story, maybe you know, people may drop him you know, some money or whatever you know, in appreciation, however it's done. The point is that the storyteller would also add chains of uh, narrators to his or her story. Right? Those who were involved in it, they made chains of narrations also. And um, uh, though their stories in, in most cases were stories which were clearly fictional, some of the storytellers did venture into actual hadith literature and claim that these things were coming from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And um, there was one example, a number of examples actually, but there's one example of uh, <coughs> uh, an occasion, one occasion, a, um, one of the scholars from the, the Tabi'een by the name of Al-A'mash, he had gone into the mosque in one of the major mosques in Basra and he came in at the time when a storyteller was, had just began his story and he was giving his chain of narrators and he starts off by saying A'mash reported to us on the authority of Abu Ishaq who reported from Abu Wa'il and he continued his chain and um, he told his story taking it back to Rasulullah Sallallahu and then, you know, this elaborate story. Anyway, uh, once he started to tell this story, and Amash heard him quote from himself, he went and sat right down uh, next to him, you know, close to the front there where he was telling the story. So, whilst this man is telling his story, after he's mentioned his chain of narration, you know, Amash started to pluck hairs from his armpit. <laughs> So the uh, storyteller, he was quite uh, annoyed, quite upset. He said, shame on you. You know, what are you doing? You know, while we're discussing matters of knowledge here, you know, not appropriate. Amr said, what I'm doing is better than what you're doing. <laughs> so he said, how? Oh, how could that be? Amr said, what I'm doing is sunnah. It's the sunnah to remove the hair from your armpit by plucking it, right? And what you're doing is you're telling lies. He said, because I am Amash. <laughs> and I reported nothing of what you're saying, right? And, you know, there are other incidents which occurred to other uh, famous uh, traditionalists like uh, Ahmed ibn Hanbal and others, right? Where uh, these storytellers were caught out <coughs> doing such things. There's also another group, which I hadn't mentioned. Uh, which I hadn't mentioned in the previous uh, session. And that was uh, wise sayings which were turned into hadiths. Uh, there are a number of sayings which were popular amongst the people, which had been handed down from generation to generation. People knew them, they liked them, whatever and they ended up in hadith themselves, right? And these were fabrications. Among them is that the abdomen is the house of disease and prevention is the head of remedies, right? And it was a popular saying, right? And it was attributed to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu uh, but it is not hadith. And there are others, a number of others. I mean, among them is seek knowledge onto China, even if it's onto China, you know? That's like a wise, saying the idea that one should seek knowledge you know, wherever the opportunity presents itself. And there are actually uh, authentic narrations from the Prophet where he does you know, make statements of that nature. But that particular quote-unquote hadith was fabricated. Anyway, 
I just wanted to add those two points that you might find on your examination. So uh, you can be aware of it. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> what we're going to be looking at uh, now is the process of hadith criticism itself. As we said previously, when we looked at the issues of the isnads and how they profilerated, they, were all, they ended up all over the Muslim world. And I gave you examples of you know, some hadiths where uh, it starts off with you know, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, 10 companions reporting from him, next generation, till you ended up with 26 different narrations of the hadith. You know? Uh, that, what that did was it lended itself to facilitating the analysis of the hadiths and their narrators, right? And the science of this, ana of analyzing uh, narrators, uh, rating them either in different categories or as valid narrators or invalid narrators, uh, is referred to as ilm al-jarh wa ta'deel. Right? Validating or invalidating uh, <coughs> narrators. And this uh, science evolved out of the basic instruction from the Prophet Muhammad in which he said that whoever intentionally lies on me will find his sitting place in the hellfire. This statement of his, well known hadith found in Sahih Bukhari and most of the other books of hadith, it caused those who were involved in narration to check and to confirm you know, what was authentic and what was not. It also discouraged those who were not sure about what they were narrating from the narrating. That's why we said, you know, of the tens of thousands of Sahaba who heard things and saw things from the Prophet the majority of them, because they all saw him. Right? Only a thousand and sixty, some narrations or some scholars say about a thousand three hundred, uh, of the Sahaba uh, actually were involved in narration. You know, out of such a large number, only a small number like that. And in fact, it is the number who actually narrated the vast majority of the hadith are less than three hundred. Because uh, we said that 500 out of that 1,060 were narrators of only a single hadith. Each one only narrated one single hadith. You know? And hundreds others narrated two and three, you know, few numbers. Those who narrated more than, uh, <coughs> more than uh, 20, you know, their number is someplace around 120 something, the total number. So, uh, the point is that people were very careful about what they narrated, and the scholars who were involved in the process of narration, you know, uh, themselves tried to ascertain the truth of whatever was being conveyed. And this actually began from the time of Prophet Muhammad himself, because <clears throat> You have narrations of companions checking out what was being said, you know, things which they learned from the Prophet ﷺ. When they've had any doubts, the well-known hadith of, of Omar ibn al-Khattab, for example, when he heard one of the companions reciting one of the chapters of the Qur'an, and then he was upset. He asked him, you know, who told you to recite like this? Because it was different from the way he learned it. And he said that Rasulullah taught him that. And he, was, you know, he felt he was lying on the Prophet because what the recitation which he had learned was completely different, quite different from it. So he you know, grabbed him by the scruff of his neck and took him to the Prophet you know, quite upset. You know, telling the Prophet here is this person reciting the Quran in another way, you know, from the way you taught. So he told him, Hisham, told Hisham, recite. And he recited. And he said, that's the way the Quran was revealed. And he told Omar, recite. He recited, and that was the way the Quran was revealed. The Quran was revealed in seven different modes, right? So here was Omar, 
you know, when he heard something which seemed which supposedly coming from Rasulullah, whether it is Quran, whether it is Hadith, you know, he is going to check it out. If he sees or feels that it goes against the knowledge that he has, he would check it out. And you had one of the companions by the name of Imam Ibn Thalaba. He came to the Prophet Sallallahu on one occasion and he asked Prophet Sallallahu you know, uh, your messenger came to us, you know, somebody had come to them as a messenger from Rasul Sallallahu and said to him such and such a thing. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, he told you the truth. So the companions would go back and double check. You know, so this is the process of verification. <coughs> or very, uh, yeah, verification. A similar, you know, type of verification of hadith, you know, have been narrated from Ali, Ubay ibn Ka'ab, Abdullah ibn Amr, Omar, Zainab, the wife of Ibn Mas'ud, and others. And uh, after the death of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi that is during the lifetime of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but after his death, you know, each of the caliphs, you can find incidents occurring of that nature, you know, where <coughs> they asked questions, they sought information, when people brought information, they would double check it, check with other people, you know, did this, was this in fact the case? And such was the, uh, the procedures which were also followed by the students of the Sahaba and their students. All of them followed the same methodology, learning it obviously from the companions of the Prophet Muhammad himself. Uh, Ibn al-Mubarak uh, made a statement in which he said, to reach an authentic statement one needs to compare the words of scholars with each other. You know, he is amongst the uh, tabi'ul. And this was the most common method which the scholars of hadith, you know, employed in the various areas of the Muslim world to check on the correctness of what was said, comparing. Uh, <coughs> There are four basic methods here. Comparison between the hadiths uh, of different students of the same scholar. Comparison between the statements of the same scholar at different times in his life. Comparison between oral narrations of the scholar and written texts. And comparison between hadith that they're ne being narrated and co related Quranic texts. These were different ways in which comparisons were made. Now the first, that of comparison between different students, this method, uh, can people just turn off their mobiles? It's just ringing all the time. Uh, in the case of the third century scholar, Ibn Ma'in, he went to Musa Ibn Ismail of Basra, a student of the great uh, Hadith scholar Hamad ibn Salama and asked him to read the books of Hamad to him. Hamad to him. When Musa asked if he had read the books to any other students of Hamad, ibn Ma'in replied that he had read them to 17 other students. Musa asked him what was the purpose of all these different readings, to which ibn Ma'in replied, Hamad ibn Salama committed mistakes and his students added some more mistakes to his. So I want to distinguish between the mistakes of Hamad and those of his students. If I find all the students of Hamad committing the same mistake, then the source is Hamad. If I find the majority saying one thing and a single student contradicting them, then the mistake was the students. Right? This was the method of analysis on the basis of the students. So <clears throat> here was Ibn Ma'in who uh, went to the students of the scholar checking the different narrations of the same material to determine where errors lay. Where errors lay. The principle was if all of the students or the majority of the students narrated the same thing. They're not going to accidentally or in error narrate the same thing wrong. It means the same wrong thing that we're talking about. 
So if there, if there's a, there, the, the majority of them are narrating the same wrong thing, then it means they must have gotten it from their teacher. That's the point. Whereas if the majority narrate one thing, and an individual amongst them, or a couple of individuals, narrate some other things, or narrating the same text in another way, then this implies that the error was on the part of the students. This was the uh, method of uh, analyzing or criticizing the narrations based on the material which the students themselves were narrating and copying down into their own texts. And what you find is that <clears throat> this practice was actually done first by Abu Bakr, Caliph Abu Bakr. Because while as a Caliph, a grandmother came to him and asked, her, asked him about her share of the inheritance from her grandson. And Abu Bakr's reply was, I didn't find anything in Allah's book for you. Because there's no mention in the Quran concerning the grandmother. Right? When he asked the other companions about it, Al-Mughira ibn Shu'bah said that the Prophet ﷺ gave the grandmother a sixth. Abu Bakr then asked anyone if anyone could confirm his statement. And Muhammad ibn Maslama al-Ansari, he stood up and repeated the same statement that was said by al-Mughira. And in this way, Abu Bakr confirmed that the source of the information was definitely from Prophet ﷺ without any uh, mistake, and he gave the grandmother the sixth. On one occasion, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari went to visit Omar and he called out, he gave a, called out uh, greetings to him, you know, knocking on his door, calling on him three times and when he didn't get any response, he left. After he left, Omar came out, called him back and asked him, why did he leave? And he said that he heard the Prophet ﷺ say, when any one of you asks permission to enter three times and it's not granted, he should go away. But Omar was saying, why did you leave? You should have just come in the house. But he related this. Omar then demanded that he prove his statement was correct. Otherwise, he would punish him. This is when he was the caliph. Right? So it's Omar, very strict. So Abu Musa brought a witness, you know, one of the other companions, who then confirmed that in fact he had heard the same thing from Rasulullah And Omar then informed him that he didn't doubt his, the authenticity of his report. But it's just that he said he was concerned that people should be very careful about what they narrate from Rasulullah Sallallahu And uh, there's also another occasion similar to this where Abu Huraira had uh, made a narration which Abdullah ibn Omar heard and questioned. It was he quoted Prophet Muhammad as saying, whoever attends the funeral until the funeral prayer receives one qirat of reward. But whoever attends the funeral until the person is buried, right to the graveyard and to the burial of the person, he receives two qirat of reward. What is a qirat? It's a huge amount. Anyway, uh, Abdullah ibn Omar, he questioned this. He hadn't heard it before. And he doubted, you know, in fact, he even said, you know, I think Abu Huraira, you're, you're narrating too many hadiths. <laughs> <laughs> so Abu Huraira took him by the hand and went to Aisha's home and he recited the hadith to Aisha and Aisha confirmed that in fact it was the truth. And Abdullah ibn Omar said, Ooh, we missed out on a lot of qirat of reward. <laughs> <clears throat> this method was also used by some of the great scholars that we know, like Muslim Ibn al-Hajjaj, right, who is the author of Sahih Muslim, 
and who was himself a student of Al-Bukhari, there is a narration that Ibn Abbas spent a night in the apartment of his aunt Maymuna, who was the wife, one of the wives of the Prophet Muhammad And during the night, the Prophet Muhammad stood up and made wudu. He got up and made wudu and began to pray. Then Ibn Abbas did the same and stood to the Prophet Muhammad's left side. The Prophet وسلم, then shifted him from the left over to the right. And he stood beside him on the right. Now, the Hadith scholar Yazid ibn Abi Zinad, he narrated the incident from Quraib, from Ibn Abbas, that Ibn Abbas stood on the right side and the Prophet shifted him to his left. Right, so there are two narrations of it. Right? So what Imam Muslim did was that he gathered all of the narration of Yazid's colleagues who studied under Quraib. And he found that they unanimously agreed that Ibn Abbas had stood on the left and the Prophet ﷺ had shifted him to his right. Then he gathered all of the narrations of Quraib's colleagues who studied under Ibn Abbas and found that they also unanimously agreed that Ibn Abbas stood on the left and the Prophet ﷺ shifted him to the right. But he didn't stop there. He further gathered the narrations of other companions who had prayed with the Prophet ﷺ, you know, alone. It was just them and the Prophet ﷺ. And they all uh, confirmed that he had them stand on the right. In which case, then it was conclusively proven that Yazid had made a mistake in his narration. Though Yazid was among the reliable narrators, but as a human being it is possible that a mistake could be made. And of course that standing on the right is standing next to the person in the same line. You know, you have some schools that traditionally have the person stand, you know, halfway behind the one on the right because they're standing beside the Imam. This person's got the one on the left is the Imam, so they don't stand in the same level as the Imam. They stand behind a bit half a step or a whole step or whatever. But there is no evidence for this practice. All of the evidence indicates that they stood side by side. I see for one to say, no, I'm going to stand halfway back because the Imam normally stands in front and we stand behind, you couldn't stand really at the same. If this is using your brain to determine something which the hadith don't support. The hadith don't support that position at all. So the correct method is to stand side by side. And of course, the women's prayer, the women's prayer, when women are praying together, and again, you have one of the schools which say women don't pray together. The Hanafi school. They don't encourage the jama'ah for women women pray separately. But the correct practice of the wives of the Prophet Muhammad was that they prayed in Jama'ah. Aisha would lead them, Um Salama would lead them, the different wives of the Prophet did lead the women in Jama'ah. So prayer in Jama'ah for women is established as a practice of the, the female companions, the Sahabiyat, and this is the correct way to go. However, when they stood, they stood in one line. The Imam, the female Imam, stands in the middle of that same line. She doesn't stand out in front of the line. And this was the method which was followed by the wives of the Prophet ﷺ and the other Sahabiyat. Now the second method is that of comparison between a scholar's statements. And again, the roots of these methods can be found back in the time of the Sahaba, most of these. On one occasion, Aisha asked her nephew Urwa to collect some hadiths from Abdullah ibn Amr, since he had heard a lot from the Prophet Muhammad Abdullah ibn Amr, remember, was the one 
who said I used to write down everything that I heard the Prophet ﷺ say until one of the people from Quraysh told me don't do it. And when I asked the Prophet ﷺ about it, the Prophet ﷺ pointed to his mouth and said, only truth comes out of it, so write. And so he was among those who are the, the major narrators, narrated large numbers of hadiths. Anyway, Aisha sent her nephew Urwa to go and uh, collect some hadiths from, uh, from Abdullah ibn Amr. And as I mentioned to you before, the companions did take hadiths from each other. Hmm? Then, one of the narrations which you heard from Abdullah which she heard from Abdullah ibn Amr, she had doubts about. But she didn't say anything. A year later, she asked um, uh, Orwa to go back and to get some more hadith from Abdullah ibn Amr and to ask him specifically about that hadith. And Abdullah ibn Amr narrated to her the hadith exactly the same way that she had heard it the year before. And at that point she said, what he, she decided, this is the decision she made, that what he narrated must have been correct because he neither added anything to the narration nor he deleted anything. To have remembered it exactly in the same way, it means that he had remembered it accurately. This is after the death of the Prophet? Yes, after the death of the Prophet. So the third way is, to, is the comparison between memory and texts. On one occasion, Muhammad ibn Muslim and Al-Fadl ibn Abbad were studying hadith with Abu Zura. Muhammad and Al-Fadl disagreed on the wording of a particular hadith. So they asked Abu Zura to judge between them. He then referred to his books and found that the hadith in question confirmed what Muhammad had, that Muhammad was mistaken. So hadith scholars did practice this, you know, going back, checking with books against what was being orally narrated. And on another occasion, Abdul Rahman ibn Omar narrated a hadith from Abu Huraira concerning the delay of Dhuhr prayer in the summer. Abu Zura stated that it was incorrect. When Abdul Rahman returned to his hometown and checked his own books, he found that in fact he was in error. He then wrote to Abu Zura acknowledging his mistake and asked him to, conf to inform his colleagues and students of his about this mistake. As he said, shame is better than the hellfire. The fourth method is that of comparison between the hadith and the Quran. Meaning that if a hadith uh, seemed to contradict the obvious meaning of the Quran, then this raised questions about its authenticity because basically the Quran and the Hadith coming from the same source will agree with each other. And an example of that was Omar ibn al-Khattab. He on one occasion rejected the evidence which was or the statement of Fatima bint Qais wherein she claimed that there was no maintenance for the woman who has been irrevocably divorced. This was a, there was a discussion going on at that time whether the woman who is irrevocably divorced has any maintenance and um, Omar took the position that she had because there is a statement, verse in the Quran, which Allah says, 65th chapter, verse 1, do not expel them from their houses, nor sh should they themselves leave unless they have committed clear indecency. Right? This is a general statement concerning divorce. And he included in that the irrevocable divorce. This was his understanding. This his reasoning. However, Fatima bin Qais, 
she had reported that Abu Amr ibn Hafs had divorced her irrevocably whilst he was away from home and that he had sent his representative to her with some barley just giving her a gift right and um, actually there is uh, evidence from the Quran and from the Sunnah that if a man divorces a woman he should give her a gift some scholars hold that it is compulsory because actually the evidence seems to point to that anyway he gave her a gift but she was not pleased with this gift you know, sent her some barley they've been married for some time so she went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi oh, she first complained and said you know, you, you know there should be maintenance this is not enough and he told her that there is no maintenance she had no claim on him for maintenance so she went to the Prophet ﷺ and complained. And the Prophet ﷺ had said to her, there is no maintenance due to you from him. And he instructed her to spend her idda in the home of Umm Shuraik. This hadith is inside Muslim. And uh, <clears throat> she is the one, of course, who, after her idda was over, Abu Sufyan, and Amr ibn al As had proposed to her. And she went to Prophet and asked him what should she do? And the Prophet said, Abu Sufyan is known to be stingy. And Amr ibn al As beats his women. So the best thing for you is to marry Usama ibn Zayd, right? who was his the son of his former adopted son, Zayd ibn al Haritha, right? And I mean, it was a big choice for her because Usama ibn Zayd was uh, the son of a former slave. Right? Uh, Fatima bin Qais was from a very noble family. And so, you know, it was a big choice. But she went for it, she said. I took the Prophet's recommendation and my life was. Anyway, <clears throat> the point is that this is what happened. She reported it. But when uh, a Sha'bi narrated this hadith of Fatima in the Grand Mosque in Damascus, Al Aswad ibn Yazid, who was nearby, heard him narrate this. He picked up some pebbles and threw them in his direction, not at him directly, but you know, his direction, and told him, Woe be to you! How can you narrate that when Omar said, we cannot abandon the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger for the words of a single woman? That is Omar's position. We do not know whether she remembered or forgot. There is maintenance and lodging for the irrevocably divorced woman. Allah the exalted and majestic said, and then he quoted the verse from the Quran. This was his reasoning this was the approach he's wrong here okay Omar doesn't mean every time somebody takes a position like this they're necessarily right in this case Omar was wrong but this was just showing the method of reasoning if they saw this uh, discrepancy then they would raise the doubt raise the question etc anyway <clears throat> in this case as I said uh, Fatima bin Qais was correct that is the ruling, correct ruling according to the Sharia, that there is no maintenance. <clears throat> and that the Idda of the woman, and this is something which is not in practice today, the Idda of the woman who is divorced three times irrevocably is only one month. What is normally practiced that is three months, whatever, in all occasions. But actually, uh, she leaves her home, she's supposed to leave the home, she does not remain in the home of her husband and she waits an edda of only one month. Now, there has been criticism of the methodology used in the criticism of hadith by some modernists and orientalists saying basically that 
there is no rational criticism that it's just slavish uh, acceptance of statements, narrated statements. There's no rational criticism. But actually, when you go back and you look at what is happening here, there's, there's reason here. People are using reasoning, but it's not blind reasoning. This is the point. It's not blind reasoning, meaning whatever seems good to me is a good reason to reject this hadith, for example. Right? Uh, you have people who have made statements, you know, whether it is the, you know, the statement of the Prophet ﷺ which said that a people who make their ruler a woman will not succeed. Okay. For the last 1,400 years, people didn't have any problem with this idea. But with the rise of feminism, right, now people start to question this. How is this? You know, we have female rulers. We have, you know. So people start to question because it seems now this idea the West has promoted where there is complete equality between males and females. They are the same, no difference between the two. Whatever one can do, the other can do. So women are now, you know, in the army, they're in the navy, they're flying planes, they're driving tanks and, you know, everything. You know, anything a man can do, a woman feels she, has, she should be able to do it too. Okay. So when this hadith now is brought forth, people question, what is this? You know, especially the modernists who have accepted this line of rationale, they rejected this. Can't possibly be authentic. You know, can't possibly be. You know, because the woman and the man are equal. The, the same. But, of course, this line of reasoning, and this is going according to whims. It's going according to whims. Because... There is clear instructions in the Quran, clear descriptions where Allah refer to the men being in a position over the women, you know, by one daraja, right? That they, that they, but that is one of responsibility. It's not an issue of superiority. Now, this is where people assume that because the male is the leader, it means that the male is claiming for himself superiority. But no, it is just that on a general scale, males are more suited to leading than females. You know, of course, again, the feminists don't like to hear this. They don't want to hear this. I mean, though the whole of history states that, they say, no, it's because the history was written by men. <laughs> and it's the men who didn't give women a chance. <laughs> it's the kinds of, you know, the people don't want to look at reality. You know, they want to, because the, all of these claims of equality, we know full well when the time for the Olympics come, do the men run against the women? Do the women run, compete with the men? In tennis, do the women play against the men? Why not? They're equal. The same. <laughs> but why? Because women will lose all the time. Right? They, they lose in all of these sports if they competed against the males. Because in reality, they are not the same. As Allah said, وَلَيْسَ الذَّكَرُ كَالْأُنْثَى The male is not like the female. It's not a vice. In America, the women, there's a glass partition to penetrate up the edge of the upper management. It's very common in America. You've got to say that. And they Yeah, in practice. I mean, with all of the legislation and everything else that has come about, you know, the situation of women receiving, you know, uh, lower pay for the same jobs, this, is, this reality remains. I mean, of course, this area Islam does not support. You know, Islam is firmly in support that if a man and woman do, are doing the same job, they should be paid equally. If they're doing the same job, they should receive the same money. That's reasonable. But the issue that everything a man does, a woman should be doing. You know, it is like the case in, um, in Toronto two years ago where women uh, petitioned, they raised an issue, a petition uh, arguing that they should be able to walk topless in the streets in the summer just as the men because when summertime comes and people start to shed their clothes right in the west uh, the men, you will find men walking down the streets in their shorts you know, bare-chested, 
Right? They'll walk down the street like this, in the parks, etc. Now, if a woman sheds her top, she will be arrested for indecency and all that. They say, well, what is indecent about that? What is a man's chest is just as you know attractive to us as our this to them. So why should we not be allowed and they're allowed? And they fought and won. They won the right in Toronto. If a woman wishes to do so, she can do so. They won the right that it is, is not against the law for a woman to walk topless down the main street. But not a single woman did it. <laughs> After all that, they won it, you know, they won it in, on paper, but nobody's doing it. Summer comes, summer goes, nobody does it. Why? Because they know that in spite of, yes, we, we did win the right, the consequences for women doing that are far more severe and harmful than the consequences for men doing it. That, that speaks for itself. Nobody has to go and you know, give any special explanation, right? Anyway, so the idea you know, of us using our reasoning to, to determine whether we're going to accept a hadith or we're not going to accept a hadith because it goes against you know, what we think to be appropriate, this uh, line of reasoning, this approach is wrong. And it has led many people into various areas of deviation. And there's a well-known hadith of Ali ibn Abi Talib in which he said, if the religion were based purely on reason, then the bottom of the sock has more right to be wiped when you're making tayammum than the top. However, I saw Rasulullah wipe the top and not the bottom. You know, clarifying that, it's not to say there is no reason here, but we are not going to judge and to do everything according to what we feel is this. this. No. If the Prophet did so and so, then that's what we do. Whether it agrees with our reasoning or doesn't agree, we must submit. Because that is the religion. The religion is one of submission. Right? So when you consider the uh, issue <coughs> of certain hadiths, and there's a book called the Quran, the Bible, and Modern Science. And I have to warn you about this book. Though the book is very popular by Dr. Maurice Bokai, Right? A French doctor who wrote it. He was a non-Muslim and he supposedly converted to Islam afterwards. Though those people who uh, know him quite intimately say he converted to Islam but he doesn't make Salah. So anyway, the point is that in his book, which has been very popular, uh, the last section of the book, the first part is dealing with the, you know, the Bible and its contradiction to scientific uh, uh, facts and how the Quran agrees perfectly with these facts, you know, very useful information. Very useful information. And in fact, uh, there is a small version of it, the Quran and Modern Science, which uh, <coughs> he did, it's like a booklet. I edited it, and uh, you know, we distribute it from our center here, the Quran and Modern Science, very good. Now, in my editing, actually, what I did was I removed some weak hadiths that he had stuck in there. He put some weak hadiths explaining some points, I took them out. Anyway, in the back of his big book, the last chapter, very last chapter of the Quran, the Bible, and modern science, he goes to hadiths and starts to discuss hadiths. And he basically is coming from the same modernist position. Whatever doesn't agree with my mind cannot be correct. It couldn't possibly be authentic hadith from the Prophet. So he goes straight to the hadith of the fly. That is a hadith which is authentic, found in Sahih Bukhari, the hadith of the fly. What is the hadith of the fly? Right. If a fly drops in your drink, you dunk him in and throw him out, and you can finish your drink. You can step on him also. <laughs> <laughs> you finish your drink. And the idea that you don't, you don't need to throw it away simply because a fly dropped in, you know, you don't need to necessarily throw it away. He said because under one wing is disease and under the other is the cure. So Dr. Maurice Bokai said, 
<laughs> Science, we don't know anything about any cure under the wing of the fly. All we know is that flies bring disease. This is what science has shown. Flies bring disease. Therefore, this hadith could not possibly be correct. This was his conclusion. Now, the point is, can we make such a conclusion? Simply because science has not discovered a cure in the fly, can we say that there is no cure? No. If somebody were to tell you a hundred years ago that snake poison is good for your heart, <laughs> you would look at them and say, are you mad? <laughs> are you insane? If a snake bites you, you die. The poison goes in your system and it kills you. Today, right, in Bangladesh, it's the biggest exporter of snake poison, Bangladesh, they extract from the snake poison, you know, the um, elements from it, and they inject it in the veins of people who have certain heart problems, and it helps them keep their heart ticking. So, I mean, for us, simply because we don't have knowledge, you know, of a thing, knowledge of a thing is an absence of knowledge and not knowledge. See, the, you know, ab if, if you don't have knowledge of a thing, that is an absence, it's not knowledge. So you can't make a judgment based on it. You can make a judgment based on the knowledge that you have, which is positive knowledge. But negative knowledge, where, you, where something is missing, something is not there, you can't make a judgment on any other claims of that area. You can just say, I don't know. That's as much as you can say. And in fact, if one just stops and thinks for a minute, it is not unreasonable that a cure might be there with the fly. Because the same snake who bites people or bites animals, you know, with their poison, they kill the animal and then they eat the animal, they must have the antidote. Because if they didn't have the antidote, when they bit the animal, they, they ate the animal, they would die from the poison. So they must have, and that's sure enough, they extract the antidote from the same snake. Right? The antidote has to be there, otherwise the snake dies. So it is not surprising to find both the harm and the cure in the same animal. There it is. Also, we have in the plants, anybody who is a botanist, you know, can list for us how many different plants have both the cure and the illness which can come from the plant in the same plant. There are many, many cases of it. So, this type of argument is not uh, acceptable and we have to be wary of such arguments because we are in a time when people you know uh, ha have access to a lot of knowledge a lot of information Muslim world people have gone to the West have studied in the West and they have been dazzled by the West you know? and so anything that the West says any position that the West holds people tend to cling on to that they must know best why why then are, you know why are they at the top and we're at the bottom it must be because they know better than we do. This is the conclusion that they make. And as a result of that, they have come back into the Muslim world and have denied many uh, basic principles from Islamic teachings and practices and uh, you know, to the detriment of the Muslim world. I mean, a good example of that is co-education. Education. I just, when I was in Qatar, I read that uh, one of the top medical schools in America, I think it's Stanford, they are opening a branch in Qatar, and it mentioned in the newspaper that they insisted that it must be co educational because that is their policy. Right? And the Qatari state could not convince them otherwise they had to submit they wanted that so they submitted they submitted to a co-educational medical institution why because stanford is the best this is, this is ignorance and the 
harm that will come out of that in terms of the community, you know, I mean, it is, it will, years down the line, it will prove itself. The reality is that it has never been proven, it has never been shown that co-education is better than single-sex education. Never been shown. In fact, it arose in America. This is one of the first places that it arose. It arose not because people sat down and fought this thing out and said, you know, practically speaking, it's obviously better and more effective. We've tested it. And so, no. It arose in America after the American Civil War where they started to give girls the right to education. Because prior to that, they couldn't go. Schools were only for boys. There were no schools for girls at all. Right? They had what they called universal suffrage. So they started to introduce girls, allow girls to come into the schools. And when they first came into the school, they separated them. Okay? They didn't have enough teachers to provide separate teachers for the girls. Some places they did maintain it. A number of other places they didn't. They couldn't afford it. So they brought them in the same classroom, but they had them separated. Girls separated from the boys. But eventually, they intermingled, and that whole principle was dropped. And it just came about as a process. No reasoning, no thinking. And in fact, studies that have been recently done in England, uh, in co-educational schools, and uh, single-sex schools, especially amongst the Muslim schools, have shown conclusively and people have been suspecting this, even the feminists were saying this to some degree, that girls, women, learn better when they study amongst themselves. And their results were far higher than when they were mixed with the boys. They did find that in those schools, in some of the schools that they studied, that the boys, when they studied with girls, and when they studied by themselves, didn't seem to be much better. In fact, they found they were, in some cases, worse. So it seemed that there was a discrepancy here. They really didn't have an explanation for it. But what they didn't do, because what is happening is in the schools, we're talking about uh, primary schools, secondary schools, the majority of the teachers are women. This is the thing. So what happened is that they separated the boys, and a woman is going to teach a full class of just boys. And of course, it was really a problem for them. Maintaining discipline in the class for women, very difficult. This is what, so this is what led to the boys' scores being lower. Because in the Muslim schools, where males are teaching the boys, they did show the advantage. They did increase their scores were far better, single sex, with a male teacher. This was the key. But the experiments they had done, they put them on the female teachers, and of course, there is this rebellion, you know, etc., etc. And the, the women had a hard time maintaining discipline in the classrooms, where it's all males. So, this is just to say that uh, when we come to, you know, issues of reason, Reason has a place, but it is a place after revelation. You know, we don't submit revelation to reason, but we submit reason to revelation. This is the proper methodology. Those who deviate, those who go astray, basically their approach is reason first, revelation second. Okay, uh, that covers the first uh, part of what I had to present to you. The second part, inshallah, will start after a 10-minute uh, break.